I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is God's child coming to you with another video. And before we get into the video, I'm going to ask each and every one of you to like, comment, and subscribe. And turn on that bell, bell notification so each and every time that I drop a video that you will be notified each and every time. And to my loyal subscribers, I want to say welcome back. And to my new subscribers, I want to say welcome. And before we get into the video, I would like to ask each and every one of you that's out there, that's watching my video, to please, please leave a comment about the video and let me know what you like about the video and that whatever I can do to bring more content to you that is biblical. I'm not here to with the drama. I'm here to give you what God wants me to, for you to have and that's the word. So please leave a comment. I don't care if it's good or bad. Just leave a comment so I know what I can do better. So at this point, let's dive into the Bible study today or into the lesson. I'm not going to even call it Bible study. I'm just calling it spreading God's word. I'm not going to call it a Bible study. I'm calling let's spread God's word. So let's get into spreading God's word. Thank you and enjoy the video. The Song of Moses is a powerful and lyrical passage found in the book of Deuteronomy in the Hebrew Bible. It is a song of praise and reflection, celebrating the deliverance of the Israelites from their bondage in Egypt and looking ahead to their future journey in the Promised Land. In recent years, there has been a renewed interest in this ancient song, particularly in the context of music and worship. Artists and musicians have been rediscovering the Song of Moses and creating musical interpretations that bring its timeless message to life in a fresh and contemporary way. One such project that has garnered attention is The Song of Moses, a musical journey through ancient scriptures. This unique endeavor seeks to explore the Song of Moses through the creation of original music inspired by its themes and verses. The project aims to capture the essence of the song's emotional depth and spiritual significance and translate it into a musical experience that resonates with modern audiences. By rediscovering the Song of Moses in a musical context, this project not only breathes new life into ancient scriptures, but also invites listeners to engage with its message in a deeply personal and impactful way. Through music, the timeless wisdom and beauty of the Song of Moses can be experienced in a manner that transcends language and cultural barriers, making it accessible to people from all walks of life. The journey of rediscovering the Song of Moses through music is a testament to the enduring power of ancient scriptures and their ability to inspire and resonate with people across different generations and cultures. It is a reminder that the wisdom and truth contained in these timeless texts are as relevant and meaningful today as they were thousands of years ago. In conclusion, the rediscovery of the Song of Moses through music is a testament to the enduring power of ancient scriptures and their ability to inspire and resonate with people across different generations and cultures. This project serves as a powerful reminder of the timeless wisdom and beauty of the Song of Moses and its message of hope, deliverance, and faith. Outline, I ascribing greatness to God, 1-4. The Lord nurtured his people, 514. Third, the people rebelled against the Lord, 15 to 18. Four, the Lord will recompense them for their deeds, 19 to 43. Fee, an exhortation to obey, 44 to 47. Six, Moses' death foretold, 48 to 52. What does the prelude, one to three, show us about the purpose of this song? From verse two, what can you learn about the effects of good teaching? If you are not good at writing songs, how can you praise God? What other ways are there to praise God besides singing? Why does Moses call God rock? Cross references, Hebrews 13, 15. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Psalms 115.1 1. 
Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory, for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. 1. The Song of Moses This chapter records the Song of Moses. This song was given to Moses by the Lord, Deuteronomy 31.19. He wrote it down for all generations to learn and remember, and then taught it to the people. The purpose of this song was to remind the people of God's goodness, as well as their own failings. It was like a mirror reminding them of their sin, showing them how far they fell short of the law. Therefore, it served as a call to wake up and repent. You will seldom hear a church singing such a convicting song these days. Many songs instead focus on our faithfulness, devotion, and love for God. While it is not comforting or enjoyable to sing this song from Deuteronomy 90, such lyrics would give us a dose of humility. We can learn a lesson from this song. It can be very beneficial to review our history, including our shortcomings and mistakes. Doing this should drive us to our knees to seek help from the Lord. The good news is that when we come to the throne of mercy, He willingly gives it. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If a person does not know he is lost, he will not seek help. Similarly, if people think they are good, they will pridefully trust themselves. This chapter is a microcosm of the Old Testament. That teaches us three things. God is perfect. We are not. We need help. The Song of Moses was not a pity party. The purpose was not to practice self-loathing. The application was not self-torture, mutilation, or despair. Rather, it was a wake-up call to repent and turn to a merciful God for salvation. 2. Good teaching is like rain and dew upon the grass. Moses' words nurtured and brought life as rain and dew bring life to the soil. Every person needs to be nourished. The words of God give life. Psalm 1. Reflect. Are you receiving the nourishment you need to grow? What are some practical ways you can be watered spiritually on a daily basis? This verse also reminds us of the importance of placing ourselves under godly teaching. The best place to find that is in a Bible-practicing local church. 3. God is the rock. What are the characteristics of a rock? A rock is firm, stable, and secure. It doesn't erode or change, not quickly anyway, due to water or wind. A strong rock can serve as a foundation, a refuge, or a fortress. It protects from the elements. It stands strong in the face of danger. Weapons that come against it are shattered by it. God will do all of this for us and more. He is someone we can lean on. He is someone we can anchor ourselves to for support. Reflect. When you are in trouble, who is the first person you will turn to for help? When in trouble, we look for someone with a listening ear, someone emotionally stable whom we can depend on. God is the rock on whom we can build our lives. Let us set the habit of turning to him first. Psalms 127.1 Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Discussion Questions who are the they in verse 5? How are they described in verse 6? What do these verses teach you about God's care for his people? What illustrations are used to paint a visual picture of the way God nurtured Israel? Why was it important for Israel to always remember God's care for them? What are some specific ways God has cared for you? Do you have any recent testimonies of his provision? What do the curds, milk, honey, and wine represent? Matthew 11, 28, 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem. Jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Psalms 91, 4-6 He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. 
You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. One, verses five to six set the tone for the song. This would not be a feel-good song. It would reflect the harsh truth in black and white. While God was the rock, faithful, true, and just, the Israelites were corrupt, fickle, crooked, and twisted. They were like quicksand, dangerous, shifty, and unreliable. And they are described as foolish and senseless. Those labels would be earned. The following verses show us that their riches came from God. Yet, instead of graciously receiving prosperity from his hand and responding appropriately, they bit the hand that fed them, turning to powerless idols. Two, the Lord nurtured them. Verses 7 to 14 describe God's tender care for his people. Here are some of the things it says about him. He was a father to them. He created them. He established them. He gave them land. He found them in the desert. He encircled them. He cared for them. He treasured them. He looked after them like a mother eagle. He gave wonderful gifts to them, including luxurious foods such as curds, milk, the finest wheat, and fine wine. God did not give them the minimum necessary. He went above and beyond. That is his nature. That is who he is. He delights in lavishing us with good gifts. Ephesians 1, 7 to 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. The picture is of a kind and loving father who dotes on his children. Our Lord is not a harsh taskmaster. He nurtures us. He protects us. He treasures us. With him, we do not lack any good thing. Psalms 3410. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Reflect and share. What good things has God given to you? How have you seen his hand of blessing in your life? Let's testify to others of God's goodness to us. How did they react when they became prosperous? Why would they turn away from God who had provided for them so well? Is the jealousy mentioned in verse 16 good or bad? Why? What does verse 17 tell us about the behind the scenes world of idol worship? How are demons still involved in misleading people today? What are some practical ways we can be careful not to forget God 18? Proverbs 38 to nine, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Proverbs 18, 11. A rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his imagination. Isaiah 2, 12, 17. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low, against all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and lifted up, and against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, and against all the uplifted hills, against every high tower, and against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, and against all the beautiful craft, and the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. One, Jeshurun grew fat and forsook God. The word Jeshurun is derived from upright. It can also mean blessed one. This word appears four times in the Bible. In each of these four times, it refers to either Israel or Jacob. The word is a reminder that Israel was called to be upright. It is a term of endearment, a sign of the close relationship God desired with his people. The people who were called to be upright were not upright anymore. The people who were blessed by God would not receive this blessing anymore. Instead, Israel grew fat, stout, and sleek. They kicked against God, forsook him, and even scoffed him. Israel became rich and prosperous, but did not give God glory. Their riches went to their heads. 
becoming prideful, turned away from the Lord who had given them these good things, and instead went after demons. It is very similar to what Hosea describes. Hosea 12.8 Ephraim has said, Ah, but I am rich, I have found wealth for myself. The people did not acknowledge God's blessings. The so-called self-made man believes that his success is due to his own strength and intelligence. However, all of the resources we have, the environment we grew up in, and even our health and IQ are all gifts from God. Every good gift is from above, James 1.17. Application. We should be careful to be humble about our successes. Instead of giving credit to ourselves, we should give glory to God where it is due. There is more to this than habitually saying, praise God when someone compliments you. Words can become formulaic and even fake. We need to go deeper to evaluate our own hearts and motivations. In our hearts, we need to truly believe that our successes are due to God's grace in our lives. When you believe that, it will naturally impact how you react to success and when people compliment you for those successes. Two, they sacrificed to demons that were no gods. Israel did not know they were sacrificing to demons. They were worshiping idols such as Baal, Moloch, Ashtoreth, and Dagon. However, this verse reveals that demons were behind these gods. It unveils the spiritual warfare that is taking place behind the scenes. Satan seeks to influence the world and ensnare people through many methods. One of these methods has been idol worship. Many of the ancient idols were likely brainstormed in a demon planning committee. A demon formulated their character, creed, and image. The idols were just a front for Satanism. If you tell people to worship Satan, they will often say, get lost. But if you create a cool looking idol, plate it in gold, and trick them into worshiping that as a proxy for Satan, they fall for it, hook, line, and sinker. From this verse, we can conclude that many man-made religions are not man-made at all. They are demon-made, custom designed to deceive and enslave. Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Three, you forgot the God who gave you birth. Let the prayer of our heart be that we would not forget him. What can you learn from the phrase, the Lord saw it? How does the fact that God sees everything make you feel? How did God react to their rebellion? What would you say to someone who asked, why is God wrathful? I thought wrath and anger are sinful. How would God judge them? Which of these judgments look the worst to you? This chapter is a song. How would singing these words help the people? How are they described in verse 28? How can you gain in counsel and understanding? What does verse 32 mean that their grapes are grapes of poison? What was going to happen to these rebellious people? What does this song teach you about the nature of God? How should we respond to the warnings in this chapter? Isaiah 61, 8. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Amos 5.24, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Romans 12.19, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. One, the Lord saw there is nothing he does not see, Hebrews 
and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. It can be comforting or terrifying to know that the Lord sees all, depending on your relationship with him. If you are in him, it is comforting. He sees your difficulties. He knows your struggles. He sympathizes and will strengthen you to face them. But if you are not in him, it is terrifying. You cannot fake God out. Every wicked thought and deed are exposed before him, and you have no place to hide. The Israelites may have thought that God was distant, but he saw. What did he see? Deuteronomy 32, 20 20-21 For they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. They have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. Two, the Lord spurned them. This entire section of the song deals with God's judgment against them because of their rebellion. In short, it confirms that the Lord will send them the curses as have been mentioned in the past few chapters. They would not escape. Three, the Lord was jealous. Deuteronomy 32, 21. They have made me jealous with what is no God. We often think of jealousy as a sin. It often is. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3, For you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Jealousy becomes a sin when we are coveting something that does not belong to us. God's jealousy is always pure and holy. He desires to protect us. He wants our undivided attention. That is good for us and serves to glorify him. The Israelites chased after false gods, and that made God jealous. Application, let us give God our full devotion because he deserves it. 4. The Lord was angry. God was very angry with him. Deuteronomy 32, 22. For a fire is kindled by my anger, and it burns to the depths of Sheol, devours the earth and its increase, and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. There are also two types of anger. One is righteous anger. This is the type that God felt. We saw it in Jesus when he overturned the money-changing tables at the temple. It is a strong emotional response to sin and injustice. God is not apathetic or ambivalent in regard to our sins. When his chosen people, whom he had nurtured so tenderly, rebelled against him and went after demons, it made him furious. That wrath drove him to take action. The action was judgment and it was just application. Being on the wrong side of God's wrath is horrifying. It is also simple to avoid. Ask him for grace and mercy, and he will be happy to give it. Hebrews 4.16 5. There is no understanding in them. Deuteronomy 32.28 For they are a nation void of counsel, and there is no understanding in them. It is not logical to bite the hand that feeds you. It made no sense to abandon their relationship with God Almighty, who wanted to build them up and try to court demons who wanted to destroy them. Sin is irrational, and so were they. Six, their grapes are grapes of poison. God took Israel from Egypt and planted them in the promised land. It was his desire that they become fruitful and prosperous there. Yet as their hearts became poisoned, so did the fruit they bore. The same picture of a vineyard gone sour is seen throughout many Old Testament passages. Jeremiah 2.21 Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? Hosea 10.1-2 Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. The more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. As his country improved, he improved his pillars. Their heart is false, now they must bear their guilt. Application. If a fruit picker came and inspected your life's fruit, what kind of fruit would he find? Would the fruit be sweet and delicious or sour and poisonous? Discussion questions. What was the application point of the song Moses gave to the people? Do we sing songs like this today in the church? Why or why not? Should we? Cross-references. For in John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Isaiah 1, 19. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. 1. Take to heart, command them to your children, 
and obey. This was the trifold purpose of the song. It was meant to warn the people about the disastrous effects of idolatry and rebellion. Cultural rot and apostasy were always only one generation away. Because of that, they needed to faithfully teach the next generation the truth. The goal was that God's people would carefully obey him. Thus, from start to finish, the theme of Deuteronomy is obedience. Discussion questions. When was Moses going to die? What does this tell us about God's sovereignty? Could Moses have avoided death by not going? What would you do if God told you that today was going to be your last? Cross-references, Psalms 93, 4. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. Psalms 90, 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Psalms 90, 17. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. 1. Moses' death was at hand. Moses lived to a ripe old age of 120. Yet he died earlier than he might have if he had not disobeyed God at Meribah Kadesh. Moses would only be permitted to see the Promised Land. He would not be able to enter it or take possession. Thus, the last 80 years of his life were spent in the wilderness. It is a sad reminder that sin is not without consequences. Even when God fully forgives, there may be some temporal consequences to sin while we are on earth. Moses wrote a whole psalm on the transient nature of life. See Psalm 90 for his conclusions. He recognized that life was short, asked God to teach us to number our days, and appealed to the Lord to establish the work of our hands. Psalms 90. Moses' work for the Lord was established. His fruit was good fruit. He lived a life not in perfect but in faithful service to the Lord. May we do the same.